Hi everybody, this is Mikey D. Welcome to my stoop. It once was a small American town, and although it sat in the forgotten corner of a giant city, it was much like any other small community around America. Everyone knew everyone else's name and everyone's business. Instead of a stream or a brook, we had the fire hydrant. We didn't have farmer's markets, but we did have a well-stocked bodega. And rather than sitting on the front porch to watch the little world fall by, we sat on our stoops. You know, it seems like an ancient time, like it was some lost city. It was like I had watched it all from the stoops of Atlantis. A long time ago, in a place far, far from our current reality, Episode 10, My First Time. I remember it as if it was yesterday. It was early summer of 77, and it started awkward and frustratingly. But in the end, it was amazing beyond all my fantasies. It changed my life. It cost me 250, and I did it three times. Yeah, youthful stamina. I was in a room with a few hundred people, and they all cheered when it was over. Do you remember your first time? (laughs) Okay, you people, you know, you have dirty minds. I'm talking about the first time you saw Star Wars. It was early June. The movie opened on May 25th, but I'm not sure I knew much about it yet. So you have to try to put yourself in a pre-Star Wars world. It's not easy. I mean, really. Can you imagine not knowing who C-3PO or R2-D2 were? Darth Vader? That bizarre name Luke Skywalker? We can take all this for granted like people in the 60s did with John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and my parents' generation did with Sinatra and Bing Crosby and Elvis. But on that early summer Saturday afternoon, my eyes had not yet gazed in awe at the Death Star, or Han Solo in his scarred chin, or the zoo of fantastic aliens, or Princess Leia in a bronze bikini. I had never heard the comical cry of the Jawa. My ears had never heard the buzzes and beeps of bots, or that heart-stopping, eye-tearing John Williams score as Luke stares at the twin sunset. Yeah, I bet you're all reaching for your tissues right now. I hadn't even added blue food coloring to my milk yet. I almost got beat up for wearing my May the Force Be With You button in front of an antisocial thug in my class. Yeah, this was even before my dad made me a very cool Darth Vader costume, also known as Girl Repellent. It was before I sealed the deal and decided to be a proud geek and sacrifice my ability to have my other first time anytime soon. You all know what I mean. I mean, right, every single Star Wars reference I drop, you'll immediately recognize. But back then, on that summer day in 77, Nope, not a one. Star Wars held no grip on the culture, the world, or my soul. We were playing Red Rover. That's when these life-changing things happen. One minute you're innocently shouting out, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Chrissy right over. And next, you're being recruited into what would become the biggest geek organization in this or any other universe. I spotted my Aunt Dee Dee and Uncle Sam heading up 118 as my little sister raced over trying to break through the firmly gripped hands of Scott and me. She wasn't even six years old, so she probably ran under our arms. In fact, I might have just let go my grip to run over and say hi to Dee Dee and Uncle Sam. Dee Dee was one of the sweetest people on earth. She had a childlike innocence and never said a bad word about anyone. And she always had a quarter for me, that special coin that could make a boring day great. Uncle Sam, whose real name was Amerigo, but was called Zammy by the guys on Pleasant Avenue, was always just Uncle Sam. Hey, what's with that music? Hey, he just hung around those guys. No, he was not connected. He was a terrific character. He would often buy me fireworks on the 4th of July. As he walked over, I could see the waft of smoke from his signature cheap cigar, and my aunt's big smile greeted me. Mike, Dee Dee said, we saw a movie that's right up your alley. Star Wars, you're gonna love it. Right up my alley. I'll never forget those words. See, again, remember, Star Wars was an unknown. Sure, it was about to explode into the consciousness of every human, but that exact moment, I knew nothing. She could have said Ball Wars or Call Wars, or Zuzis or Cars A for that matter. But the seed was planted, the little gear was pushed, the switch flipped. In a matter of days, I would be changed forever. 
The following Tuesday started out normal. It was a warm, sunny day. Scott and I were bored. It blows my mind when I look back and wonder how I could ever be bored having entire days free to do whatever. I dream of days off now. I would give anything to have an entire summer filled with the days of cotton candy sunshine free from the job. But there were me, Scott, 22 years old between us, and the two of us were wandering up the block hoping a duffel bag of M80s would fall from the sky, or maybe Anthony D would set off an aerial bomb, or maybe Vinny the Cat Joke Man would wander by. Yeah, Vinny. He was a nice man, but he had some disabilities. We knew we just loved his jokes. Hey, Vinny, tell us a joke. Okay, uh, well, why did the cat cross the road? Why? So, so we could drink soda. <laughs> what, did, what did the cat say to the dog? What? Hey, I'm a cat, you're a dog. <laughs> hey, that was the humor we were into at the time. Give us a break. We were all loving. Anyway, Scott was taking a drink from the hydrant and I was scanning the street. It was quiet. No Anthony, no Vinny, no rhyming Ralph, no Charlie Ding Ding. Then I spotted Dee Dee looking out a third floor window across the street. That movie, the one that was up my alley. I turned to Scott. Hey, we should go see Star Wars. Okay, Scott agreed, but I had like 50 cents on me. I looked to Scott, do you have any money? Scott pulled a crumpled dollar from his pocket. I had already spent my allowance. I mean, I could ask my mother for more money, but then I would need 250 for the movie, plus bus fare, popcorn money, I guess even a movie ticket for Scott. This was all a lot of money. Scott's parents were both at work, and his Uncle George was not around. It was time for the act. The pathetic routine that had worked in the past with my grandmother. We positioned ourselves below my aunt's building. I waved. She waved back, and I started. Man, it's so boring. Scott laughed and whispered, You think your grandmother will give us some money? She's my aunt. Scott slipped into character. Yeah, so boring. I wish we could do something fun. Yeah, no money. After a few more of our sad and desperate moans, I heard my Aunt Dee Dee call my name. I looked up. She tossed something. And like a little green bird, it fell to the sidewalk. It was ten bucks. Two folded, crisp photos of Lincoln. Go to the movies, she said. We did a dance and thanked her over and over. Star Wars awaited us on 86th Street and 3rd Avenue. My mother had just recently given me the okay to go downtown alone with my friends. I could not go further than 86th Street, but that was as far as I needed to travel to a galaxy far away. We took the 7th Avenue transport, uh, I mean the bus, down and rushed to 86th Street to the theater. We hadn't even checked the times. We really didn't care. We were just glad to have something to do. I stepped up to the ticket booth and this grumpy old man, he was probably 19, but when you're 11, everybody seems old, he just stared at me. Two tickets, please. I said, holding out a fiver. We had the other five for large popcorns and large sodas, and it would even be change. Yeah, 1977, I miss you. Where are your parents? He mumbled. No, it's just me and him, Star Wars, rated PG. Have to have your parents, or adults. But it's PG. Nothing but dead eyes looked back. Then he shook his head. Oh, come on. No adults, no Star Wars. Man, that sucks. I looked at Scott and we sulked away from the ticket booth. Then I heard a sound. Psst, psst. I turned back and this guy, peeking out from the side doorway of the theater, was waving at us. He had on his blue shirt and black pants. I guess he was the security guy. He pissed, pissed again and then waved us over. We stepped closer. Hey, you want to see the Star Wars? The Star Wars, yes. Me and Scott really wanted to see the Star Wars. Go around to 87th Street, he said. I'll let you in through the back door. He was serious. Me and Scott looked at each other and smiled. Well, why not? We came to see this movie. That was right up my alley. Now we're going to enter through some back alley. Some secret entrance. We raced to 3rd Avenue and up to 87th Street. There was this black door. No writing on it. No numbers. No doorknob. Just a plain black rectangle of metal. We hovered around it. And then after a moment, there was a sound of metal latch and a squeal of hinges. In a desperate need of WD-40. The door opened and the guard peeked out and waved to us. So you have to remember, me and Scott were streetwise enough to make these decisions. Neither of us would have gone in alone, but we had each other's backs. We rushed to the door where the man had his palm out. First you pay me, then you see the Star Wars. Fair enough. The dumb ticket guy didn't want our money, then this guy would get it. I slipped him the five bucks and he gestured for us to follow him in. This strange music was playing. It was upbeat, kind of jazzy and a little funky. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I began to see faces. Outlines of oddly shaped bodies. I was in a lounge or a restaurant, maybe a bar. 
people, no, no wait, they were aliens, creatures, all shapes and sizes. They spoke in about a hundred different languages and were playing weird card games. Some were looking at me with great suspicion. There was a skeleton in a hood, two furry beings kissing in a booth, two alien Fonzie types arguing, this big furry dude, a devil looking guy and a walrus thing we would have butt for a mouth. Then this ugly guy behind the bar pointed at me and said, Hey, we don't serve those kinds here. They'll have to wait outside. Oh no, we were found out. We weren't going to be able to see. Then Scott snapped me from whatever daydream I had slipped into. Some precognitive vision, perhaps. The guard brought us to the opening in a curtain and said, Enjoy the movie. We were in. The theater was full as we entered, but no one looked at us. All eyes were on the screen, on the movie that had already started. We rushed to the front row where there were some empty seats. We sat. I looked up at the screen, and like that, bam, my life changed forever. I had no idea what I was looking at. There were two guys in white armor but no helmets, a pretty woman in a white gown and big earmuffs or headphones or something, and this giant hairy monster thingy. They were up to their knees in water. Then there was a monster, and then robots, and then spaceships, and illuminated swords, and this old guy vanished from his robes and an animated chess set, and, and battles, and more aliens, and this really bad guy's voice was booming and evil, and then more explosions and laughs and excitement, and then this huge explosion and a fanfare of music, and gold medals for everybody but the big walking carpet, and then scrolls of names on black, and great music, and, 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 and we stayed and watched it all again and again, hiding in the bathroom between shows. Those words appeared before me like a revelation. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. It was my new mantra. It even impacted the way I would open my podcast decades later. And as I sat watching it from the beginning, I had only one thought. Where had you been my whole life, Star Wars? You had been made for me. As my Aunt Dee Dee had predicted, this was right up my alley. That summer, I went on to see Star Wars 24 more times. When it came out on VHS, I would, I would watch it dozens more. And the sequels. Scott, me, and my buddy Russ and my cousin Joe would cut school to go see Return of the Jedi on its opening day, getting to the theater at 6.30 in the morning. I wanted to write more stories and make movies. I devoured any show that looked behind the scenes of the Star Wars universe. George Lucas was God. Nothing had inspired my imagination like this had. And although most of the guys on the avenue had probably seen it as well, I mean, who hadn't? I was now officially not like them. I had donned my official geek badge and raised my banner high for better or worse. No movie since would come close to that impact. But from then on, the world looked differently and held more possibilities from my stoops of Atlantis. This has been the Stoops of Atlantis with Mikey D. Stay tuned for future episodes as we journey back to that ancient mythical land that actually existed, East Harlem. And please join the Stoops of Atlantis Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, and subscribe on YouTube or iTunes. See you next time.